Good morning. This is Pastor Chuck Tyree. Welcome to this sermon from the Norwich Alliance Church. Uh, first, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, uh, this is uh, July 4th weekend. We come to you today uh, thanking you for the freedom that we have in Christ. You've set us free, as your word says, from the law of sin and death. You've given us the opportunity to love and serve you and to love and serve our fellow men. Uh, this is an amazing freedom. Uh, we not only thank you for our spiritual freedom, but also for our physical freedoms uh, purchased at such a dear cost uh, by so many. Help us, Father, to use our freedom to glorify you, to live our created purpose in Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we uh, explore today more about holiness, we're going to look into uh, who we are. Uh, last Sunday, we explore the idea of who God is and the idea that we'd never understand anything about holiness or right and wrong, uh, good and bad, apart from a holy God introducing those concepts to us and then modeling them for us as we looked at the character of God, the integrity of God, the attributes of God, we discovered what holiness it really is. And, and it's not what the society, which is uh, created by fallen people like ourselves, uh, would think it is. Well, today we're going to take another step. Uh, last Sunday we talked about holiness and, as an attribute of God, uh, mentioned more than 300 times just in the Old Testament. Uh, today we're going to take a look at ourselves uh, in light of God's holiness. Uh, who are we and what are we like? Uh, reflected in the eyes of a God who created us to love us, but also who sees us as we truly are. So let's uh, begin with the idea that you and I uh, have a human nature, and the Word of God describes what our human nature is like. Uh, for example, Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Well, the idea is I can't even understand my own heart. But God is speaking. He said, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. So who is it that determines what our deeds deserve? Well, that's a holy God. Not you, not I. Uh, that's not our prerogative. Well, if you look at sinners, and the Bible tells us that all men are sinners, uh, some uh, perhaps uh, more invested in a life of sin uh, than others and not even trying to be good, but, but we all are sinners. And the problem with that is that we all tend to think we're superior to someone. Um, murderers and, and thieves and people who, who are in prison, uh, if you visit them, and I have, uh, will tell you that they feel morally superior to people who've committed other crimes. Well, so do, so do I, and so do we. Uh, I can identify with that. I, I think my sins are not so bad and other people's sins are worse. But God doesn't see it that way. He sees us as equally broken, equally loved, but equally broken. Uh, the Bible reflects this view of us. Surely, uh, the psalmist said, I was sinful at birth, sinful from the moment uh, my mother conceived me, Psalm 51, 5. Uh, Romans 3.23 tells us we've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. All, no exceptions. So that means the most righteous person you can think of in human history, the, the best person you know, uh, is still imperfect. We've still broken God's law and broken his heart and we're so sinners. We have no moral standing or understanding apart from God. We said that last week. And that means that our efforts, our best efforts, uh, the best efforts of any human who's ever lived, uh, our moral striving to be good or to be good enough will always fall short. Isaiah uh, chapter 64 verse 6 says, all of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We're all shriveled up like a leaf and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. This is the picture of humanity that's in the Bible. And so the person who has the idea that all of us are really basically good, 
uh, disagrees with God who created us and invented uh, moral purity and the difference between right and wrong. And, and if you disagree with God, you're wrong. That's very simple. Romans 3.20 says, Therefore no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. So the idea is that um, our striving to be good, and by the way, that's a, a functional description of every other religion in the world, is uh, you get to their version of heaven by just being good or at least better than other people. Uh, that's not the picture from uh, the Old or the New Testament. If we aren't good enough and can't be good enough apart from God's assistance, then what's the solution? How can we find a relationship with a holy God? Well, God has a plan to make us holy, and it's not our plan. It's his plan. So let's look at uh, this next idea. Holiness is God's expectation for us. Well, that's amazing considering that that we are flawed and broken and all of us sinful. Now listen to this prayer from the psalmist. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Wow, blameless, innocent. How is that possible uh, since all of us have broken God's law and sinned. Well, it is possible, and, and that's because God makes it possible. It's possible for us to have an undivided heart. That's a description given again and again in the Old Testament of a person, uh, the kind of person that God is looking for. Someone who is seeking to love and serve God with, with all their heart, without ulterior motives, without manipulation, uh, without trying to keep one foot uh, in my uh, carnal desires and the other foot pleasing God, but, but to be sold out to loving God and living for Him. Listen uh, to uh, my Old Testament professor from seminary, John Oswald, in his book, Called to be Holy. He said, to have a perfect heart toward God is to obey His covenant stipulations, to make Him the absolute Lord of our lives, to submit to his will, to call sin what he calls sin, to call righteousness what he calls righteousness, and to view people as he views people, to slash everything out of our lives which stands as a rival to him so that he can fill our lives with himself and transform the very way we imagine reality. What a great vision uh, for a great life. So unless our hearts are consecrated to Christ, single in purpose and love, our outward performance is just an attempt to manipulate God. And that will never work since he knows my thoughts before I think them. Our reward is going to match our faith and our faithfulness. It's, it's reflected in, in pure hearted love. Uh, it says in 2 Samuel 22, 26 to 28, to the faithful, you show yourself faithful. To the blameless, you show yourself blameless. To the pure, you show yourself pure. But to the devious, you show yourself shrewd. You save the humble, but your eyes are on the haughty to bring them low. The idea that we could, in the, in the power of God, be blameless and pure and single-hearted. Uh, our performance may not be perfect, but our, our intention and focus on pleasing God uh, can be. Are you thinking, uh, this is too Old Testament perhaps, uh, thinking that, that we uh, need God's help uh, to pray his prayer? Well, you know, God forgave our sins and cleansed our guilt because of our faith. Uh, when the psalmist was praying, he said, no deceit was found in them. They weren't two-faced, they were single-hearted. God understands our weaknesses. So I wonder, are you praying the, pro the psalmist's prayer today? His, his prayer was to keep your servant from willful sins. May they not rule over me, and then I'll be blameless, innocent of great transgression. 
Jesus taught us to pray, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one in Matthew 6, 13. A key to understanding God's expectation for us is this prayer that says, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Uh, there are things about us that, that God hasn't shown us yet, and we don't know. Uh, we, we might be doing some things wrong, and we think we're doing things right. God understands that. But there, if there are things that we're doing that are wrong, and we know they're wrong, he also understands that. So this is not some legalistic maneuvering to get God's passing grade, but rather a loving surrender to him as our Savior and Lord. Uh, to seek to live a life that's pleasing and, and make that the goal of life. Uh, not to live and find out what we can get away with and still go to heaven. The Holy Spirit is here to help us, to judge our thoughts and words and empower us uh, to make the right choices. Jesus said it's not the exterior things that condemn us, it's the things inside us in our hearts. Uh, our plans to disobey God without attempting to change. It's cleansing us to belong to Christ without any intention uh, of, of if we think we can belong to Christ and don't serve him, uh, that's not true. Well, let's look at our third point. And this is very important. Holiness is about having a perfect heart toward God. 2 Chronicles 19.9 He gave them these orders. So this is a command from God. You must serve faithfully and wholeheartedly in the fear of the Lord. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, it's from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, uh, theft, and murder. And he said, it's also out of the hum your heart that, that good things come. It is possible for us to have an undivided heart with God's help and the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Uh, that was true in the Old Testament. Uh, that reference to people with undivided hearts or single-hearted toward God, uh, who had a willing spirit toward God, is repeated again and again and again throughout the Old Testament. So unless our hearts are consecrated to Christ, single in purpose and love, our outward performance will never change. And as I said, our reward is going to match our faith, that quote from 2 Samuel. Now, you might be thinking, Chuck, all of this is too Old Testament for me. I, I, I want to hear from the New Testament. What does it say about this? Well, since this is Communion Sunday, and in just a moment, we're going to share uh, this table with the Lord himself as his family, uh, purchased by the blood of Christ, uh, forgiven, and given a place at God's table. What about examining our hearts to find out if they're single-hearted or, or we're double-hearted? Uh, we have uh, two loves instead of one. Well, uh, as Paul was introducing uh, communion in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he told us every time we take communion, we're supposed to examine our hearts with the help of God. Uh, this is a little bit of a long passage, but follow with me. This is 1 Corinthians 11, 28 to 32. Everyone, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ will eat and drink judgment on themselves. This is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we are discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be fully condemned with the world. God wants us to take a hard look at our hearts with his help and with the help of his word, not according to the standards of our broken culture. Uh, that's a little bit, as I said, like uh, people who are, are consummate uh, breakers of God's law uh, looking at each other and saying, well, at least I didn't do what you did. Uh, that's not going to justify anyone in the sight of a holy God. Is my heart divided? That's the question. And Jesus wants to take all of us and allow us today to be devoted completely to him. He longs to have sweet, powerful communion with us this morning. 
But if our hearts are sick and infected with sin, and we have ulterior motives, God knows. So let's recap for a minute before we look at uh, the verses and communion. We're all born sinners. We need to accept that truth about us because it's in God's word from Genesis to Revelation. We're blind to God's goodness in any real sense of right or wrong until we allow his Holy Spirit to give us understanding about that. Only by God's grace do we see this truth and understand that it's true of me and true of every human being. Thankfully, God has a loving plan to show us what holiness is by introducing us to himself. Jesus said, uh, follow me, uh, follow my example. We can see who God is by looking into the life of Christ. And then he'll give us the opportunity to become like him. He can enable us to have a single heart toward him and toward the Father, to keep us from intentionally breaking our relationship with him. Jesus wants you and me to have pure hearts, surrender to Christ with no rivals for our affections. Give him your heart today as we share this love feast together with our Savior. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you, uh, coming to your table today, this communion time, and I pray that those uh, who are home will find some juice and bread and maybe pause the recording at this point and uh, get ready to have this moment with you. As we examine our hearts, we pray that you will give us insight into who we are in your eyes. Loved, certainly but also uh, sinners, uh, not perfect in our performance, uh, like, like your children who uh, try hard but, but don't always succeed in living our love for you perfectly. I pray today that we might dedicate ourselves to you, the parts of us that are divided, where we're trying to hang on to our favorite sin and hang on to Christ with the other hand, that we'll let go of that today and ask you to forgive us and give us grace uh, to not go back to it. Lord, uh, we want to remember that you gave everything for us on the cross. That's what communion reminds us of. Uh, we are reminded of this passage that Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So as we remember you today, I pray that we would remember you by surrendering as completely to you as you did to us. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me, 1 Corinthians 11, 24 and 25. Lord, may we pour out our lives before you. May we be single-hearted in our love and devotion uh, and so be like you in this, in this time. May we share this with you today and tomorrow and the day after that, the one after that. Uh, we pray these blessings in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen. Say, uh, come visit us. We're at 35 Wawikas Hill Road. Our services are open. We're spaced. Uh, uh, you can wear a mask or not wear a mask if that's your choice. Uh, we're safely distanced apart. Here's our phone number if you'd like to reach us. Uh, also, our email address is here on the screen and our website address. Um, check us out on, on, the, uh, on the web. Uh, we'd love to see you soon, and God bless you uh, this week as you live for Christ, and Christ lives in you.